Hello friends and welcome to Evident Grace Fellowship. I'm glad you're gathering and worshiping with us at home or wherever you, wherever you may be watching this. And we're very thankful that God has sustained us as a church throughout this entire time period. I'm glad we've been able to worship together one way or the other. Before we begin our service, I want to remind everyone that we are planning on gathering together as a church again for in-person worship on June 14th at 10 a.m. at the Ron Rosner YMCA. Uh, your leaders, have, we've put together every single thing we can to be as safe as possible. If you'd like to know that information but you don't have it, please email the church, church at evidentgrace.com. Uh, we've posted that information on Facebook. Uh, we've recorded a video for us, we've got a podcast, and we've sent out an email. And as we get closer, we will let you know of any changes in our plan as we adapt both to the CDC recommendations and any of our governor. Having said all that, those are good things to keep in mind because our service today is going to be from Romans 13, where it specifically talks about our interaction with government authority. It's going to challenge us to understand that, but also it's going to give us an opportunity to understand how well we live underneath the authority of God himself. In light of this wonderfully challenging passage, we're always going to preach grace. We're going to look for grace. But if we're not challenged in these verses, we may very well be missing what Paul from the book of Romans and the Holy Spirit intends for our hearts. So what I'd like for us to do now is please let's take a few moments Let's be quiet before God, and after this time of reflection, uh, I will call to worship us from Scripture. So, friends, I'm glad you're here. Let's take a few moments. Let's ask for the Holy Spirit to prepare us yet again, and I'm glad you're worshiping with us. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you for gathering us. You have, you are, and you will continue to sustain us throughout this time. And right now, Evident Grace Fellowship is scattered, but we pray and pray that we will be gathered together in person soon. As we meet in this way, whether it be listening to this, going down the road, whether it be gathering together as a family, I pray that your spirit would work mightily, Father, please, would this service show less of me and more of you? And would you both break us and restore us as we look at the scriptures? Father, enable us to offer worship to you now. <clears throat> Thank you that you will accept it through Jesus Christ and the work of the Spirit. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our call to worship comes from 1 Peter 5, and it's going to do us well to keep this in mind. This verse is going to address a lot of what's been going on in our hearts these last few weeks and even today. 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7 says this, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that the proper time he may exalt you. Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. This call to worship reminds us that as we humble ourselves before God, he'll lift us up. And he wants us to articulate our anxieties and tell him about them because he cares for us. Let's pray that God would enable us to do that now before the throne of God. Let's sing that very song. Before the throne of God. Yeah. 
continue worshiping by singing all creatures of our God and King.
portion of scripture that we hope that God will use to move us towards repentance. Repentance is the beautiful act of the Spirit's work in your heart to realign yourself with God's character and His commandment. It's the Spirit's work in your heart to weave transformation and to make you like the person of Jesus. When we look at a portion of scripture for a time of repentance, what we're praying that God will do is that that scripture will show us areas in which our thoughts, our speech, and our actions, it will show us where those things have not reflected the character of God or the commandment of God. And then when we're aware of that, by the Spirit's power, we confess those things and repent. And in that repentance, in that walking away, in that turning, we are met with the grace of Jesus Christ and forgiven, and we become transformed and more like the character of our Savior, Jesus himself. In light of what I mentioned earlier, this passage this week in the sermon is going to talk about our interaction with authority, government authority, spiritual authority, and ultimately the authority of God. Let me read Hebrews thirteen seventeen to us. 1317 tells you, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who might give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. In this context, this passage is specifically speaking about everyone in the church's submission to authority. For the members of Evident Grace Fellowship, it speaks to uh, your submission to the authority of the elders. For, for me, as a, a pastor, it speaks about my submission to the authority of the Presbyterian, the denomination. No 
Christian lives outside of authority, at least not obediently. We are those who are under authority. Christ was under the authority and obedience of God. We are under the authority and obedience of, of the church, and we all are under the authority and obedience of our government. And it is difficult because on this side of heaven, earthly-wise, everyone that we're under authority of, we, they're sinful. They're not perfect. They don't reflect Jesus perfectly. And, and when leadership is cast, when authority is exerted, our hearts want to respond and rebel because of that lack of perfection. But God uses earthly authority to teach our hearts submission. And he uses earthly authority for us to greater value and appreciate his heavenly authority and the spiritual authority he has in our lives. So that as we learn the difficult, difficult obedience of submission, we understand our Savior better. We are transformed to be, transformed to be more like Him. And our hearts grow in a longing for heaven. In light of Hebrews 13, 17, a commandment to all the church, my encouragement to you is this, where is it that you fight this earthly authority? Where is it in the authority of the church that you fight? You don't, you don't want to be called or challenged on your sin. You make a bigger issue about how it was said instead of what's actually going on in your heart. You poke and prod at the inconsistencies and even the sins of your leaders more so than the challenging of your own heart and living it out within the sense of the church. Where is it that your heart hates submitting to authority? Where you recognize that and confess it, you will become more like your Savior, Jesus. And the second half of this verse says, when you submit to authority, the work of your leaders is more joyful and not a burden, and that's only a benefit to you. Which means when people in the church groan and complain about their leadership, it makes it more difficult for their leadership, which then makes it more difficult for you. Your complaint and your lack of support actually is counter and makes things more difficult for you. And for me, myself, and for you, we all have to long for heaven where we will enjoy the beautiful reign of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But then now... We obey and submit and confess our sins. Friends, that's an encouragement to you to spend this time of silence asking yourself, where is it that you fight against authority? Where is it that you make things more burdensome for your leaders? Confess that sin. Long to be more like Jesus Christ and enjoy restoration and forgiveness yet again. Let's spend a few moments silent before God. Heavenly Father, thank you that yet again we confess our sins and we are met by your grace. Thank you for Jesus Christ who showed us what it looks like to live in this world interacting with other authorities. Forgive us if we make the lives of those above us in authority more burdensome. Forgive us of complaint and griping, and complaining. Make us more like Jesus. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our assurance of pardon, our promise of forgiveness comes from 1 Peter 5, verses 10 and 11. Let me read it to you. After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace 
who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. The promise of 1 Peter 5 is that we will be restored, confirmed, and strengthened, and established through God. So despite the fact that we sin, despite the fact that we have a rebellious heart, God the Father will strive with us. He will be patient and persevere. We will be restored. We will be confirmed, strengthened, and established. And through it, we will celebrate God's dominion and His rule forever and ever. I want to move this now towards the prayer for the kingdom. First of all, friends, I want to remind you, please, that uh, as you give to the work of Evident Grace Fellowship, I want to say thank you for your consistency, your faithful, and your sac sacrifice. In the links of this, uh, we will make sure that the online giving link is there. Please continue that. Please continue your faithfulness. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. We do look forward to the opportunity of gathering on June 14th and, and, and worshiping together in giving. But thank you for your faithfulness, and I exhort you to it now, and I will pray for our offering. In addition, I'm going to pray for the continual healing of Beverly Bouchard. Thank you for everyone who has reached out to her. Friends, reach out to her as she uh, recovers um, from her cancer surgery. And then I'm going to pray for our wounded and broken nation. Let's bow our heads. Father, you have been faithful. You've established us. You have confirmed us. You've maintained and supported this church. And I pray that we would continue to give faithfully and thankfully, thankfully and sacrificially. And Father, as we eye towards gathering together in person, I pray that you would protect us. Would you ease our fears, calm our anxieties? Would you gather us together and protect us from sickness? Father, thank you for the work that you're doing in Beverly Bouchard's life as she recovers from her surgery. Thank you for her sweet servant spirit, seeking to serve the church even now in her recovery. Would we love her, care for her, and show her how much we are thankful for her, give her family, Jim, specifically, and all of her family, the ability to support her well. And Father, our country is broken. We are torn apart by politics. We are torn apart by differing opinions from the medical world, all the way to how we should handle this virus. Our hearts are broken as we see the, the, the murder of George Floyd by a police officer. It's horrible to witness. Children to adult have seen it over and over again. Father, change. Change this. Show us as a church how we speak out and uphold the gospel and the work of Jesus Christ our Prince of Peace, show us, Father. Right now, enable us to mourn. Protect our country as, as riots are breaking out. It would be a church, Father. Would we be a church that, that lifts up Jesus Christ, that we would speak against all acts of abuse and racism. We would be unconcerned about the opinions of others when it comes to lifting up Jesus Christ, the one who reconciles us all. Guide us. Father, comfort those who mourn and transform those who hate. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, in a moment like this, in a season like this, we need to be reminded of whose person we bend our knee. His name is Jesus Christ. So let's sing together at the name of Jesus. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess him, King of glory. 
It's the Father's pleasure We should call Him Lord Who from the beginning Was the mighty Word Humbled for a season To receive a name From the lips of sinners Unto which he came Faithfully he bore it Spotless to the last Brought it back victorious you to stand for the reading of God's Word. Our passage today is Romans 13 verses 1 through 7. Please allow me to read them to you. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Please be seated. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of God stands forever. The political context of the book of Romans and the Church of Rome really begins around the end of 30 A.D. Around 30 A.D., towards the end, uh, Gaius Caesar became the emperor of Rome. Now, you may not know who Gaius Caesar is by name, but you may know him by what people called him and what he called himself. His name was Caligula. Caligula was a merciless tyrant. He wanted no help from the senators. He wanted no measure of partnership. And this 
demand to have things the way he wanted spilled over into an era of sensuality and sinfulness like no culture has almost ever experienced. Caligula was known for drunkenness, mass orgies, rape, kidnapping, and abuse. If it was sensual, he pursued it and indulged it. He encouraged it, and he did not care in any way the effect or impact it would have on others. Ultimately, Caligula was assassinated. And he was replaced by his uncle, Uncle Claudius. And Uncle Claudius was looked at differently, and Uncle Claudius governed differently. Uncle Claudius was a man born with a disability. He was deaf in one ear. And because of this disability, he was more apt to partner with the senators. And he was less inclined to attack the outer world and expand the kingdom of Rome. By every measure, he was almost the opposite of Caligula. But there was one area that Claudius was merciless. He had a deep-seated hatred for Jewish people. He hated the Hebrews so much that he banned them from Rome and cast them out. And if you were a Jewish person in that day, the only choice you had was to either flee Rome or be executed. Was the end of the 40s came together and moved into 50s, Claudius was replaced by Nero. And Nero exceeded Claudius's hatred of the Jewish people with his own personal hatred of Christians. He took Jesus' claim as king and lord and savior as a competition to his throne. And he took Christians' allegiance to Jesus as their king and lord and savior as treason. And as a result, he hated and persecuted Christians. In fact, at one point in time, he set fire to a large portion of Rome and then blamed it on Christians so that the Roman citizenry would also hate Christians. Mass persecution and death and martyrdom occurred. It ultimately got so bad that, that Nero would kidnap Christians, dip them in wax, light them on fire, and impale them on sticks to light the streets of Rome. This context of sensuality, racism, and persecution is the political context for the book of Rome, book of Romans. This past, present, and future is what was going on when Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said, let every person be subject to governing authorities. How could Paul say that? Rank sin and sensuality. Israel, the, the, the Hebrews, cast out and executed. Christians horribly, horribly persecuted and martyred. That's what's going on, and Paul writes, be subject to that governing authority. When I read it, I almost want it to say something different. And I'll be honest with you, friends, I didn't pick this passage out for this week. This is the burden or the benefit, however you want to see it, of preaching an entire book of the Bible. You start at one verse and you end at another. And I would not pick this passage for this week. But God has providentially chosen it for us. And here's why I say that. When I read, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, I am painfully aware of the interaction presently of our governing authorities. 
We have people who hate President Trump. And then we have people that merely make him the second savior. We have people who vilify and hate our governor because he's told us we have to wear masks indoors in public spaces. This week we watched on video the death of George Floyd by a police officer and we're presently watching rioting and looting taking place in cries for justice. And in all of these things that I just mentioned, each and every one of you have a different opinion. Some of you say, he's doing a great job. Some of you say, he did a terrible job. Some of you say, well, that man wasn't murdered. And then some of you say, well, but what those people are doing, they're, they're not crying out for justice. And already we're nearly divided just in the, the, the eight minutes of this sermon. And God gives us this providential moment to say, let every person be subject to those governing authorities. What a struggle. What an opportunity for faith. I remind you, friends, that just last week we looked at Romans 12, 21. And Romans 12, 21 tells you, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. There's two quick applications to that. For you personally, in your fight against sin in your own heart, one of the means by which God is gifting you to overcome that evil in your heart is by imitating your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as you seek to imitate your Savior, that enables you then to fight the sin in your heart as you're more aware of it and more dependent upon Jesus. But culturally as well, when we see great evil in our world, that passage commands us, don't fight evil with evil. Don't fight evil with greater evil, ever. But the weapons against that evil in this world are holiness, goodness, and righteousness. So, as we prepare to look at this passage, I want to pray for us once again, and then we'll look at our big idea. Father, we need your Holy Spirit to help us to understand this passage and great wisdom on how we'd apply it. Help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Our big idea this week is the role of government in the life of a Christian. That's what this entire passage is. Verses 1 through 7, and we're going to look at a very similar passage next week. But this entire passage is wanting you to understand the role of government that God has given you. And we find three things in this passage. We find the order of authority. We find the nature of rules and rulers. And we find the role of your conscience. Let's look at the order of authority verse uh, first. Uh, Romans 13, 1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. Every person. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. The only reason we have authority in this world is because God has established there will be authority. God himself is authoritarian. And therefore, as people, as image bearers of God, we will exist in various areas of authority. And no matter how much we want it at times, every one of us is under some authority. And every one of us bears some role of authority. So when you are in the midst of God-instituted authority, when you resist it, you are resisting something that God has established. And when we do that, it is an action worth the judgment of God. When you read that, you might think, Gordon, there's got to be something. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. That, that's got to mean something different, doesn't it? So let me tell you what it means to be subject. It's a, it's a word called hupatasso in the Greek. It's used around 39 times. In various forms. It means this. It means to obey, to be under, to put under, or to subdue under. It means exactly what it sounds like. 
And we see in various places in Scripture. We mean Hebrews 2 7. All things have been put under Jesus' feet. That's Hupatasso. Everything is subject to Jesus. James 4 7. Submit yourself to God. Ephesians 5 19. Submit yourselves to one another. Ephesians 5 22. Wives, submit to your husbands. We see this over and over again. The, the picture of authority and subject to authority is living out our image-bearing nature. God is authoritarian, and he wants us to live under authority. And in doing so, we have a greater affection for his perfect authority. And then, as image-bearers, as those who walk about in, in this creation, we will demonstrate authority. And as we do so in a godly fashion, we will show others what it's like to be led by the godliness of the authority of God himself. We say, Gordon, how in the world am I going to be subject to a governing authority if it's evil and corrupt? Someone this week said, I think our governor is overstepping. My response was, it's what government does. I don't mean that cynically, but I mean in power and being sinful, we always struggle with overstepping authority. If given authority, we're always going to overstep it because we're not perfect. The picture of godly authority is humility and to see the better of those of which we have authority. But we know in this world, it's, we've seen government after government after government that is corrupt and sinful. And you say, well, Gordon, do I have to, does that mean I have to do everything that authority tells me to do? Everything? And the answer is, of course not. This command needs to be taken into account of God's other commands. One of the hallmarks of the theology of this church, one of, the, one of the characteristics of Reformed theology that we hold to, is this approach to authority in our government. You see, here's when you know you don't have to do something authority tells you. There's actually three cases. If there is a law, and that law in and of itself is sinful... You don't have to obey it. If there's a law that said you have to murder everyone, you wouldn't have to obey it. So if the law in and of itself is sinful, you don't have to obey it. If your obedience to that law is sinful, you don't have to do it. So is that thing objectively sinful? Is in doing it you're sinful, you wouldn't have to do it. And there's the third case. Does it violate your conscience? What does it mean to violate your conscience? Well, Scripture could not have addressed every single thing in this world. So, to violate your conscience would mean that you look at this principle and you find some government or some law, and in and of it, it's violating a biblical principle. And you would say, well, that violates my conscience as a Christian. That means you're saying, in doing that thing, I find it sinful. In doing that thing, I find it sinful. We don't have to do it. Nowhere in obeying government authorities are you being told to sin. But instead, you are being told to demonstrate the likeness of Jesus Christ in obedience, even if the authority is difficult or it's a law in which you grossly disagree with. Nowhere in here does it say, hey, you have to like the laws. If you say, that law is stupid, you may say that, but that doesn't give you an opportunity to disobey it. Stupidity is not an opportunity to disobey. Is the law sinful? Is in obedience, would it be sinful? Does it violate your conscience? Does it violate your conscience? Again, remember, Paul is writing this to a church that has just moved out of an awful, awful leadership of Caligula. And Claudius hated the Jewish people. The worst racism you can imagine. And Nero hated the church and Christians. And what is being called to here is a godly submission to authority that does not sin. 
How do you demonstrate a submission to authority that does not sin would be the question here. So what that means is if there was a law, you would obey it and you would do it in such a Christ-like manner, others would be amazed by how you could do that. Your very character would demonstrate the work of the Holy Spirit. doesn't mean you don't have a voice, but it does mean that you would demonstrate submission as an act of obedience even to God himself. We have a lot to go on here. That gets us started. But the, the, the role of the government is there's an order of authority. But let's look at the nature of rules and rulers. This is important to us. Verse 3. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. You can say, Gordon, there's been terrible rulers all the time. But we'll address that in a moment. Rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who's in authority? Then do what's good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good, but if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Paul, when he wrote this, hadn't forgotten Pharaoh. He never, he didn't forget the, the execution of Jesus Christ. Paul knows that there have been awful, awful, awful rulers throughout history. But the role of that leadership is to bring order and to do good. And when I hear that, I hear the words coming out of my mouth. I think, but I can think of so many who were not. But for the Christian, the picture is, okay, this authority's role is to do good. And as long as I don't sin, as long as I am not doing any law that is sinful in and of itself, then God may very well be calling me to a season where my authorities are oppressing me, but they are moving me towards greater sanctification and likeness of Jesus Christ. You see, here's our foundational problem with this. You may have a valid disagreement with our government or a particular candidate, but this passage tells me you are subject to terror if you express that disagreement in a dishonorable way. In this season, it's very easy for us to pick the candidate or the politician that we don't like. And it's very easy to be entertained by people online or on television mocking them. Tuning into radio shows that create nicknames so that we can just Hate on the politicians that are in place. And I know that I've been guilty of this, and I know you have as well. And those people that we're watching and listening to, they're either saying what we wish we could say, or we just echo their thoughts themselves. And it's sin. It is. You see, we're not called, Paul's not advocating a, a passive, silent Christianity in the pagan world. Paul is calling us to say, hey, Christians, can you disagree with the government in a way that's completely different than the world? And if we join in with the mockery, and if we join in in the degradation of other people's character, all we are is likening ourselves to every other person in the world. How can the Christian demonstrate disagreement, but in a way that is honoring to God? How? We've got to speak truthfully and respectfully and remove the spit and the venom. Now, I had an opportunity to preach on this passage Ten years ago. Ten years ago. And I remember at that time, the Christian world was on fire because of President Obama and the changes going on in this country. And I remember preaching that passage and, and trying to encourage my church to stop with the vengeful and venomous language that was inconsistent with the character of a Christian towards our president. And now, it has been raised to a brand new level. Either targeting our president, or our governor, or our candidates. And it's raised to a new level because the avenues 
for these things, whether they be radio or internet or YouTube or whatever, just demonstrate our desire to rebel in a sinful way so badly. If you want your voice heard about a candidate or a politician or any other authority, if you want it heard in such a way to have an impact, don't look like the world in doing it. Don't mock your president. Don't mock the candidates. Don't mock the police. Don't mock your pastor. Don't mock your parents. Don't mock your teachers. If you disagree, disagree in a way that does not incur God's wrath. The intention of that authority, the God-given intention, is, would be for good and not bad. Are those authoritarian figures sinful? Yes! Blatantly and openly so right now. Proudly so. Right now our authorities who sin brag about it. In the spirit of mocking and hatred and venomous speech is disgusting. May it not be so among the church of God or any Christian. We have to remind ourselves that God could command this in the era of Caligula, Claudius, and Nero. When we do this, when we demonstrate Christ-like approaches to authority, it wins the approval of God. God looks at that and goes, that is the correct way to do it. When we do it, when we disagree in such a fashion that we take joy in humiliating others, it does not gather God's approval, but his wrath. Friends, let's continue on. The role of government in our lives. We see the order of authority. We see the nature of rules and rulers. Let's look at the role of the conscience. The conscience is the inner work of the Holy Spirit to, to guide us and to also show us what is godly and ungodly. Look at verse 5. Therefore, one must be in subjection. Again, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. When we, when we speak of or interact with our authority in, in an ungodly way, it violates our own conscience. Verse 6, For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to them whom honor is owed. Paul says, pay your taxes. Pay your taxes. Now, I did some research this week. I was like, how bad were the taxes under Caligula, Claudius, and Nero? And you know what? They weren't bad. Honestly, tax rate was about 1% to 2% because Rome had nearly conquered the world. They didn't make their money from the people's taxes. You go, aha, Gordon, Paul's telling people to pay taxes. It wasn't that bad, but there were lots of taxes out there that weren't included in the 1% to 2%. Taxes for Christians were often doubled or tripled because Jewish authorities moved from their spiritual role to a tax role and made extra money by taking taxes from Christians. If you sold in the, in the marketplace in Rome and you dyed your clothes, you know what you often had to dye your clothes with? Urine. And there was a urine tax. Get that. <laughs> they would tax you for your own urine to dye your clothes. So why we might say, that didn't seem too ridiculous, 1% to 2%. The taxes in Rome were utterly ridiculous. Utterly ridiculous. And Paul's saying, listen, pay your taxes. And if you owe someone, give them what you owe. And if God says, give honor to them, give honor to them. Give honor to God. Give honor to your politicians. Give a, a, an honor to uh, your pastor and your officers in the church. Give honor to your husband and to your wife to your parents, and to your teachers, to the police, to... And again, we list this list and you go, but Gordon, there's a bunch of those that are sinful and bad. And I'm like, yes, they're all. But God wants you to give them the honor that is due and to demonstrate Christianity in a way that has an impact in the world. 
If your disagreements with authority, if they cause you to speak disrespectfully, or if they cause you to lob personal attacks of character, or they cause you to wish harm on government authorities, then you're bringing disservice to the name of Jesus Christ when you do it. If I just list authorities, it probably incites some reaction to you. Bill Clinton. Donald Trump. Hillary Clinton. Barack Obama. Governor Northam. How do you react? How you react is going to teach your heart so much about where you approach authority. Friends, there's so much wrong in this world. There's so many sinful things. And, and, and we need to be Christians who speak out against sin. We do. There's not a, a passive Christianity that's being promoted here. Where there's sin, we should speak out against it. We should lift up the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But we must do it in a God-honoring way. It should look different than the way the world speaks out against the things that they disagree with. At times, those two may line up. The world and the church may disagree, or excuse me, may find something in this world wrong together, but the way the church speaks of it should look completely different than the way the world speaks of it. We should be actively at work against sins and injustices in this world. Proclaiming Jesus Christ. Listen, think about the way Jesus approached it. Think about Jesus. He, he was spat upon. He was betrayed. He was handed over to corrupt authority. And he did all of this because we do all that. Our voice was the voice that was mocking Jesus. Ours is the voice of hatred to Jesus. We were sinners. But he, he obeyed in all of those things so that we might be forgiven. And what did Jesus say about all this? To his disciples in Mark 12, 17, he said, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar, and to God the things of God. It was like paying your taxes to Caesar, and whatever God's told you to do, do that as well. Before Pilate, before his execution, his crucifixion, Jesus said in John 18, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that it might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom's not of this world. He's like, hey, Caesar, if I fought like you guys fought, if I was so wrapped up in this world and not the world of my heavenly home in heaven, you know what happened? My disciples would be offering a rebellion against right you. They would storm your family. We would storm your home. We would storm the city hall. He goes, but they're not going to. You know why? Because they're part of the kingdom of God and not the kingdom of this world. And yes, 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 I know at one point in time, Jesus called Caesar, that old fox. And you're like, well, Jesus was speaking a little bit. No, 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 no. Remember, we imitate Jesus in his character, but we don't imitate Jesus in ultimate authority. He had authority over all things. Remember that we saw that in Hebrews, all things have been placed under. If he wants to call a lesser authority a fox, he can. You don't get to. Jesus calling Caesar a fox is not licensed for you to then mock other authorities. Friends, we are to demonstrate before our authorities a godly character that reflects Jesus Christ. We're supposed to work against the sin of this world, but we do it in such a way that it looks vastly different than the pagan world out there. Because we have the transforming work of the Holy Spirit. We have seen Jesus' work. We have the commands and the work of the Holy Spirit. Yes, we should have an ultimate struggle with evil authority in this world. We should recognize, though, that we also have a sinful struggle with authority in this world because we just don't want to bend the knee. But God says authority is a gift from me to this world. Friends, let's move forward towards a conclusion if you're joining us for the first time. We, uh, 
we restate our big idea with a truth, an application, and an action. A truth is a statement. An application is how we should live. And then a truth, excuse me, an action is something we can do. Our big idea was the role of government in the life of a Christian. And we saw three things. The order of authority, the nature of rules and rulers, and the role of the conscience. Our truth is this. God uses governmental authority to teach our hearts how difficult it is for us to submit to him. God uses authority in the government so that we can look at our hearts and go, wow, I have a hard time submitting to God, much less government authority. When we struggle with authority, what we're really saying is, I don't want anybody to tell me what to do. But we are those who are under the authority of God and under the authorities that he has established in this world. Application, live knowing this. Friends, live knowing that submitting to authority is intended to create an affection and appreciation for a holy and righteous God. When you submit to imperfect, sinful authority in this world, it's intended to increase your affection for God and long for heaven. Our action this week, friends, we need to become students of Jesus. We need to search and research and look for his character. Become a student of Jesus. You don't have Jesus' authority, but you're called to demonstrate his character. We don't have his authority, but we are gifted with the ability to demonstrate his character. Friends, these are really difficult times. The outworking of this virus, changing rules and laws and requirements that we fight against, massive injustice in this world that breaks our heart, an upcoming election that looks to be as contentious as any we've ever seen. May we be those who demonstrate the character of Jesus in the midst of these things. May we be a church that lifts up the gospel of Jesus Christ always and the work of Jesus Christ as our hope for change in our hearts and in the world. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. Enable us to reflect his character. Thank you for your perfect authority. Enable us as a church to make a great impact on this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's celebrate our true king with crown him with many crowns. <laughs>
friends, thank you so much for worshiping with us. Um, I pray now that God would protect you, would protect us, guide us, and I pray that we'd be blessed in this benediction, this promise from Scripture. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest and abide with you both now and forevermore. Amen. Friends, thank you so much for worshiping with us. I can't wait to see you again and hopefully in person. Thank you.